What is Big Little? So Big Little is an architecture that includes uh, different CPUs, but that have a, uh, an architecturally similar, um, that are architecturally similar. So basically the CPUs have different capabilities, but their architecture is the same. So the code that runs on one processor can easily run on the other processor, and not only just run, but can be migrate seamlessly on the other processor. The fact that the architectures are similar also uh, means that there's a one-to-one -one mapping between one processor and another, okay? Um, and this is key to uh, our design. So the processors, as I said, they, they are similar in their architecture, but they differ in the performance that they yield. The, the chip that we have been working with is the, the TC2 from ARM. So it has a cluster of uh, A15 cores and a cluster of A7 core. In, um, in the clusters, there's, there's three A7 cores and two A15 core. Um, usually, you want to have the same amount of chips in your clusters. Uh, we did, or the, 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 uh, the odd number of, of cores in the A7 cluster, in the little cluster, um, was on purpose. So basically, you design a bad system just to make sure that you catch all the bad clauses. Uh, but normally, you want to have a system that has the uh, same amount of cores in both clusters. Um, so as I said, the, uh, the, uh, the A15, the A7 are architecturally similar. They both implement the ARM um, uh, V7A architecture. Um, the, the caches are, are SNOOP with um, a cache coherent interconnect, so the CCI 400. And there's also an interrupt controller that allows uh, interrupts from any source to be routed to uh, any destination. So any processor to any processor. So this is, the, uh, this is a picture of the chip. So we have our two clusters here, the L2, the interconnect at the bottom that is seamlessly snooping the caches and the, uh, the programmable uh, source and destination controller here at the top. There's also um, an I.O. coherent master. Uh, in our design, we didn't have to use it simply because we did not have um, an external processor like a GPU that needed its cache to be uh, aligned with the rest of the system. Okay. The idea be behind Big Little is to provide maximum power or maximum efficiency with uh, uh, maximum power saving. So we want to have uh, the performance that uh, like an A15, A15 cores would, would give you, but with the power saving that the A7 cores uh, would, would provide in the system. The original idea was to run uh, tasks that are CPU intensive on the bigger cores and tasks that don't require as much horsepower on, on the smaller cores. But that is very difficult because uh, you can't predict the future. You don't know who's going to be uh, CPU hungry and who's going to be light. Another way of, of approaching the problem is to go with the system load. So how busy is your system? If your system is very busy, you move to, you use the, uh, the bigger cores. If your system is lightly loaded, then you save power and you move to uh, your smaller cores. And that's the, uh, that's the, uh, the, um, the state of mind that we decide to, to use in, uh, in, in, in our design. So we currently have two projects in parallel. One is called HMP, so uh, heterogeneous multiprocessing, and the other one is IKS. The cool thing is that uh, they are present in the same tree. So one can move from one scheme to another scheme on the fly. Okay, so it's enabled in, in, in the SysFS, so you can turn on the IKS solution whenever you want, or you can switch it off in order to make different benchmarks if you want. Um, the in-kernel switcher can also be turned on uh, at boot time, 
from the kernel command line or uh, via kernel config uh, at compile time. So let's talk about HMP just a little bit. Um, in HMP, all the cores can be powered on at the same time. They can be processing instructions at the same time. It doesn't have to, but if your system is heavily loaded, all the cores can participate. Um, in order for that to happen, the CPU has to be aware of the different processing capabilities of your cores and your system. Um, and it provides higher peak performance in some, uh, some of the tests that we've ran. <coughs> Interesting is that everybody can participate in this project. It's open. It's done in the open. Um, our tree is open, and it's currently running. The fact that it's being done uh, in partnership with the community uh, introduces delays that, uh, well, we're all, like, familiar with, which is why we... Um, we're also working on the IKS, the in-kernel switcher. This is a, um, a stepping stone solution. It's not perfect, but right now it's booting, it's providing awesome performance, and uh, uh, most important, it is readily available. So it's providing like a solution that people can start base, basing their products on in order to, uh, to move quicker, okay? Uh, in IKS, what happens is that a big CPU and a little CPUs are coupled together into a virtual entity. And that virtual entity is then presented to the kernel as if it was one processor. And that allows us to reuse everything that the current SMP scheme is giving us. So the kernel is not aware of the big little architecture <coughs> that it's currently running on. So all, most of the code that we wrote was pertaining to the management of the clusters and not necessarily with scheduling or anything else. I'd say 99% of, of what's in the kernel right now has been reused. We didn't have to change it. Um, it's important to understand that once you have that, that virtual core presented to the kernel, you can only have one core. So either the A7 or the A15 processing instruction at any given time. Okay, so if you started in your system with six CPUs, so three CPUs in your, your, your big uh, cluster and three CPUs in your little cluster, once the switcher logic is switched on, is turned on, you end up with three cores. Okay. The, the, the decision within one virtual core, the decision to, to either use the big cluster or the little cluster is taken at the CPU freak driver level. And that's the only entity aside from the uh, in-kernel switcher that is aware of this virtual coupling that we've done. Okay? Aside from that, it's seamless. Everything that uh, pertains to a normal core also applies in this case. Um, this solution, as I said, is readily available. We released it to our members back in December, and we are still continuing uh, to fix bugs on it. They aren't that many. It's providing a pretty good results. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk about that later. So yeah, it's pretty much done, and it's, it's working uh, very well. One possible solution in the coupling of our CPU was to go horizontally. So basically take, uh, as I said earlier, if your system is lightly loaded, uh, you use the, uh, the, the small cluster and as uh, demand on the CPU increases, you move on to the big cluster. The problem with this, this approach here is that the granularity is too coarse. It's either all or nothing. You're either on the small cluster or you're on the big cluster. And there are some, some power savings that can be done here in between. Uh, it's also introducing a synchronization <coughs> period that we did, we did not want to take. So if the, 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 the first score, so the A70, is ready to move on to the bigger cluster, there has to be some synchronization done with the second uh, core in the cluster for it to be ready for the move as well. 
And while that happens, you can't really process information. You can't, you can't continue um, uh, the, the work this was doing. And therefore, it's, it's increasing your, your, your blackout period. A better solution was this here, to integrate <coughs> vertically. Okay, so by integrating vertically, um, you create two virtual CPUs, and they are basically independent from one another. So at any given time, you can have uh, processing happening, well, processing can be happening on, on the different cores independently. So if on virtual CPU zero, you're, you're running on the small core, nothing prevents uh, uh, the big core to be used on the second CPU. Okay, and so on for the rest of your CPUs that you might have based on the amount of CPUs you have in your clusters. Okay? So the idea here is that all of the clusters, all of the CPUs and the, the all, all of the virtual CPUs are independent from one, non one another and they can basically uh, uh, use whichever core within the virtual cluster that they want. <coughs> There's, there's no rocket science behind how, how the CPUs are grouped together. All we do is basically, in the switcher logic, is we take the, uh, the sequential number of each CPU in the cluster and couple them together. As I said earlier, in the TC2 implementation, we have a stray A7 core. So that A7 does not have a counterpart in the A15 cluster. And as such, we, switch, we simply turn it off. So in order to use uh, to make maximum gain or, or utilization of your hardware. And if you want to use the IKS solution, uh, you best have the same amount of, of cores in both clusters. Otherwise, the, cluster, the cores that don't have a corresponding uh, c core in the other cluster are simply switched off. Um, once that grouping has been done, one of the cluster in the virtual in the virtual CPU that was created is switched off, and the, the the current algorithm that we have is that if the CPU is part of the booting cluster, you keep it on; otherwise, you switch it off. But that really doesn't matter because as soon as your user space will be loaded, and the governor will start uh, um, normalizing everything, and then based on on, on how loaded the system will be. Uh, Either the big, the big core or the little core will be used, okay? As I said, nobody else aside from the switcher logic and the CPU freak driver needs to be aware of that coupling. And that allows us to just hide the big little implementation from the rest of the kernel. When the switcher logic initializes, so when the kernel boots, all the, uh, the, the processors are discovered by um, SMP, DSMP scheme, okay? So up until the point where the switcher logic is turned on, the CPU is faced, or the, the switcher knows about all of the CPUs in the system. Switcher logic comes on and synchronizes with the CPU driver core to basically tell it to <coughs> unregister itself. The initialization of the switcher logic is done. Uh, the CPUs are coupled together, presented to the kernel, as one, as, as a set of virtual CPUs. And once that is done, another message is sent to uh, CPU freak driver to reinitialize itself. But this time it will reinitialize itself on the virtual CPUs rather than the real core that existed before. Okay? And during that initialization in the CPU freak driver, the, the operating point, the frequencies that can be tolerated or accommodated by the virtual CPUs is the aggregation of the both, both your small uh, core and your big core. So if you, if you had, for instance, six, uh, uh, eight operating, operating point on the A7 and eight oper operating point on the A15, once the switcher logic has been turned on and the CPU freak driver is reinitialized, you have 16 frequencies that are presented to the CPU freak core. Okay. So this is, this is basically it. Before the switcher logic, you have like the A15 that can go from 500 megahertz to 1.2 gigahertz, and the A7 core. And these are frequencies that are presented to the CPU free core. Once the switcher logic has been turned on, then we basically 
expose to the core 16 frequencies, which is the compounding of our A7 and our A15 here. But you will also notice that the, the upper frequencies have been split in half. Right? These frequencies here can be whatever you want. It can be numbered from, from 1 to 17. It does not matter. These are simply indexes that the CPU free core is using when the, the governor is requesting an increase or decrease of, of, of CPU performance. So we can write whatever numbers we want here. What is important to understand is that if a frequency of 300 is requested, the CPU freak driver will turn around and say 300 on the A7, that's basically 600 megahertz. So the real frequency that, be, that will be running is 600 megahertz. All right. When I've been giving this, this, this talk before, people were saying, well, why are you reducing the, the, the capabilities of, of the A7? They're not really re, uh, reduced, right? This is simply a table that's being sent to the CPU free core to tell it about the operating point that are possible by the architecture. Okay, this is, this is very key to, to the solution. Any question on this? No, it does not. The question was if it matters if the numbers are sequential. Absolutely not. Yes? The question was if? Depending on your implementation. That, that, that's definitely specific to our implementation, right? In our case, it was true. Yes? For the same pairing, how does the performance compare between the cores at the same frequency? For A15, A7, yeah. it was half, right? So, so you could do twice as much processing on the A15 than you could on the A7, right? So f when, when we first did this, what we did is simply double the frequencies of, of the A15, just but it's really the same thing. As I said, these are simply indexes. Right? It could be 1 to 17. It doesn't matter. Right? It's up to the CPU freak driver to do the proper conversion in the background. OK. All right, technology. Sorry about that. Okay, so this is another way of looking at uh, uh, what I just presented earlier. All right, we have our real frequencies, our real operating point and power on the side here. the The blue line is the A the A seven, and the red line is the A fifteen. When the switcher logic is enabled, this is what's being presented to the kernel. All right, one long contiguous range of operating points. And in the middle here, we have a chasm. We have a bridge just because we go from the small core to the big core. We'll come back to that graph later. CPU free driver is doing a lot in the solution, but that lot turns out to be very simple. And Going from one core to another core in a virtual CPU really comes down to these eight lines of code and is very simple. So basically, if you're on uh, uh, the A7 cluster and you're, th there, there's a request that comes in for a frequency that uh, can only be accommodated by the A15, then your, your new cluster is the A15. And the same is true on the A7, all right? So and in the end, there is some housekeeping that's happening between the two. But in the end, once that, that the CPU freak driver has determined that we want to move to another cluster, it simply calls the switcher logic and for a request. It simply calls the switcher logic to move the current processing from 
one core to another core. And again, that is still between that virtual entity that we do present to the kernel. Okay. So, so far, we, we have seen that we have basically the switcher logic and the CPU free driver that are aware of our little scheming, but nobody else, right? And that's exactly, uh, that's exactly uh, what we're going to present here. How do we go from one core to another core? If we take, for instance, uh, at any given moment, we are on a virtual CPU zero, and we are running at 200 megahertz. And there's a new request that comes in to run at 1.2 gigahertz. CPU free core is allowed to ask for that because we have presented one big range, right? CPU free core knows that we can oper that CPU can operate between one 175 megahertz to 1.2 gigahertz. So a request like that is definitely sound and, and should be accommodated. On the flip side, the CPU free driver knows that the A7 cannot deal with a frequency of 1.2 gigahertz. Right? So we will go through what happens when the CPU free driver decides to go from one core to another. Okay? So as I said, running on virtual CPU zero at 200 megahertz, I wanted to go to 1.2 gigahertz. So what happens? In this here, the uh, A7 is, 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 um, will be labeled the, in, the outbound processor, and the inbound processor will be DA15. Okay? So when a request comes in, uh, the outbound CPU will switch on the inbound, right? So power up. What we've done is normally when a CPU is powered up in the kernel, it will simply call secondary startup. In our case, this is good, but we need to switch on the cluster and switch on the CCI if those haven't been set up yet. So we created a new startup point for the CPUs that will do just that. Okay, so outbound powers up the inbound, inbound comes up to life, woohoo, all right, we're executing. It will look at the state of the cluster, we'll look at the state of the CCI, right? Initializing the cluster, turning on the Snoop interface, if this is the first CPU in the set, all right? Once this is done, it will simply wait in a tight loop for instruction from the outbound processor to move farther. And this is because we want to have an exact synchronization between the two cores in order to allow for cache snooping between the two. Because you don't want to have to go back to RAM once you've had like a switch over. You want to stay with your cache. And this is why we have the, inter the, the cache coherent interconnect. We want to snoop our caches in order to minimize the hit that a move over will, will get you. All right. So, um, Interesting thing is that the outbound is still fetching, is still processing uh, while the inbound is coming up, right? Again, that is still to minimize uh, the hit on, on moving from one core to another. And the outbound will simply wait for a, um, an inbound live signal, okay? Once that, this, once that has happened, we have an outbound that is ready to go out and we have an inbound that is ready to come in. So a normal step of operation, interrupts are disabled. Migration of interrupts occur. So interrupts that were routed to the outbound processors are routed to the inbound, right? And this is when we start the blackout period, where nothing happens in the system, okay? <coughs> the current context of the CPU is being saved, and once again, we go back to our one-to-one -one mapping that I talked to uh, at the beginning, right? Both CPUs are running the same architecture, therefore this is possible. Once the context has been saved, we simply instruct the outbound to start at secondary startup. And secondary startup will be fed the same CPU ID that the outbound processor. Therefore, the inbound will start exactly at the same point that the outbound left. Once the inbound has received, is, is executing secondary startup, it will simply enable interrupts, uh, handshake with the outbound, and continue normal execution. This is exactly as if you're reopening the cover of your laptop and the CPUs are coming back to life. That's exactly the same sequence. 
except that instead of being on one processor, we're now on the other processor. And this is possible because of what? Two things. We fed the exact same CPU ID that the outbound left us, and we have a one-to-one -one mapping between uh, our CPUs in terms of register sets. This here, once the outbound is alive, kicking, and executing, yep? Come again? We, we, f we, the context in the CCI. Yeah, like, like the CCI is not involved in this, okay. right? Absolutely. The only job for the CCI is to snoop the caches, okay. right? So at one point earlier in, in the sequence, we opened the gate on the CCI on the inbound processor, and now we're just about to close the gate on the outbound. So once the inbound is alive and kicking, it's very important that its stack and its contact is not disrupted by the, cl the, the cleaning up of the outbound. Otherwise, you'd, you'd have, uh, you would basically step over the context that the inbound is executing and lead to a crash, okay? So for that purpose, a new stack is spun off as soon as secondary startup is called on the inbound CPU. Since a new stack is spun off, then you can do pretty much whatever you want and go about shutting down uh, the outbound cluster. So at that point, the cache is flushed. If, if it's this last CPU in the cluster, then the CCI for that, that cluster is switched off, the interface, I should say, and um, the cluster itself is disabled, and we call wait for instruction. That's it. The outbound is dead. Yes. Well, the last man is, is, is on the per cluster. Okay, right. so. Right. So, 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 so basically, if, if, you're, if, if you have a cluster of four cores, whether it's the big or the little, right, and it's the last CPU in that cluster to be switched off, then what you want is to dis disable snooping for that interface right. and disable the entire cluster because right. these take power. Right, so that's that's the case of the last man here. Now, are the caches in particular, I'm, I'm especially concerning with the CCI interface, um, do the caches in the big and the little clusters run the same clock rate for, for snooping? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Excellent. <coughs> yes, sir? Uh, speak louder, please. I got the, uh, the other... Say so. I wouldn't say so. I, I, yeah, maybe I'm not getting your question properly, but I, I maybe rephrase it. So, um, <coughs> these are expensive. Yes. It, it costs a blackout period for sure. Yeah, I doubt that you will be able to see it uh, from a user point of view. Uh, I, I, this, this is, this is uh, 20 microseconds, like that the switch takes over. Right. And you might see it for like, like that, tw that 20 <coughs> microsecond, but after that it's gone. Right? You're running on the Ahelia core. So you might take one hit, but... I can't hear you. 
Well, it, it, it's important to understand that CPU idle is still, is still uh, um, we still have a CPU idle uh, driver that takes care, that's running at the same, in, the, in, in the system at the same time. It does not do that. It does not do, those are two different operations. So CPU idle will switch off an entire virtual CPU rather than moving between the two. How am I doing for time? Okay, it's not bad. Yes? How do you manage the uh, uh, IO, CPU IO, CPU, Yep. Yeah, so it's all seamless. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, yes. So, so. Two different things. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that's why, so in, at one point we had to stop, right? We said we're, we're producing a model, we're producing a reference platform, but you can go absolutely math crazy on, on how to infer that, oh, this next switch is going to take me too much and therefore I'm going to, you know, g stop there. there there's, there's no end to the amount of algorithm that, that you can do for that, right? And at that point you think, well, do I have a product or do I not have a product, right? And, and one, one algorithm will probably work with for 80% 80, 80 of your test cases. And then what do you do with the next 20%? You have to start over. Right? So it becomes extremely difficult. OK. A few things that we haven't talked about uh, so far. But if you start looking at our code, you will stumble on it pretty quickly. Um, the mutual exclusion that we have for setting up, for configuring the clusters. Right? This is. This is happening in real time. Okay? We, cannot, we cannot count on the fact that there will be only one processor at any given time configuring the CCI. Right? So we, have, we needed to introduce a mutual exclusion uh, algorithm that works in assembler uh, in order to avoid multi, uh, multiple CPUs to try to configure uh, the CCI and the clusters at the same time. We talked about the last man standing. Right? This is just the tip of the iceberg that we talked about. Okay, um, early poke mechanism. So the handshake mechanism that works with IPI between the two processors. We, we can't go into details into this, but it is there and is key to the, uh, to, to what, to the solution. Uh, yeah, and we're also uh, keeping state, uh, the states, uh, we're tracking the states of our, our CPUs and our clusters. That's also important when uh, when to know if a CPU has been requested to shut down, but another CPU is requested to bring it up, right? So it's very difficult. Okay, so we know about the in-kernel switcher. We know about the CPU freak driver and CPU freak core. What we haven't talked about is uh, the governor. Right now, we all our benchmarking had been done with the interactive governor because uh, the benchmark themselves were working on Android. Right? It was Bbench. So for that, and, and we're also targeted an Android audience, so for that we used the interactive governor. Any governor for that matter can be used with IKS. We've used on demand and it works pretty well as well. Okay, so any type of governor, as long as you have a CPU freak driver, uh, will work. But you will very likely have to tune the governor. And this is what we did. Okay. In its original form, the, uh, the interactive governor responds to how loaded the system is. If the system is loaded to up to a certain point, so let's say 80%, it jumps to a certain CPUs, to a certain frequency. And from there, it, moves, it will slowly move up to the remaining ones. This is working very well. But in our case, we not only have one CPU, but we have a couple of CPUs within the same, within the same virtual core. So we needed to shield, exactly like the CPU freak driver is doing right now, we needed to shield 
the, the higher frequencies, the higher operating point, the costliest in terms of power, we needed to, shear, uh, to shield the, late, the, the, late, the, the last operating point on the big core. And that's exactly, and that's why we've introduced a second high-speed freak uh, variable that does exactly the same thing that the first would do. And that prevents uh, from reaching the overdrive point on the A15. Right? So this is the exact same algorithm that we had for the interactive governor, except that we duplicated it. Right? And that allowed us to, to uh, make significant uh, power saving. Again, our big chasm here. Okay? So our first, our first uh, high-speed freak, which is basically the, uh, the frequency that you uh, run at after your CPU load has passed a certain threshold, we've set it to uh, basically 500 megahertz, which allowed us to run 85% of the time or as for as long as the CPU is loaded at less than 85%, we would run on the A7, and from there we would move up to the A15. Okay. So as I said, um, we were working with Bbench in terms of uh, performance metric, and Bbench gives you uh, a score of for how quickly your pages are rendered, a web page is rendered. And we also use the power consumed at the core, and that for each core, okay? And we threw in the mix uh, playing audio in the background. We thought that would be a good use case, so browsing the web, playing audio in the background. Our goal was to get to a 60-90 ratio, and this is very key. This is when we knew that we could stop. Okay, uh, so that is, if you have a perfect system, or the, the most powerful system would be, in this case here, would be a system consisting of only A15 cores. So that was our best performance and the power target. So we were able to achieve 60% of the power consumption of a system that would have two A15s, and yet reach 90% of the performance of such system with our big little solution, okay? That's the 60-90 ratio here. Uh, depending on the tuning that you do, you're able to get different power points. Um, so again, this is, this is our best, most performance system. This is a, a system that would have two A15 in it, right? So the, uh, the blue diamond here uh, shows our, our 90-60 points. So 90% of the performance, that's 60% of the power. If you tune your performance, uh, for a very crisp system, you can have a system with the, uh, the, the red box here. You can have a system that runs at 95 of the performance with about 65% of, of the power. This was very, very cool. We wanted to continue optimizing, but we had a divergence, a variance in results that was about 5 to 10%, so we had to stop. Yes? What do you measure power consumption? Energy. energy. Um, so this here, this is a system that would consist of two uh, A7 cores. So this is our most performant in terms of, of uh, power saving, okay? The green, the green triangle here shows that if you're not tuning your solution properly, you can do worse than, than your best, most performant system in terms of power saving, right? And this is, this is something I really have to stress for, the, and I will stress for the rest of this, this talk here, is that if you take the solution and slap it on top of your own implementation, you will spend as much time tuning it than you would bringing it up, right? If you do not tune your governor properly, all efforts are wasted. And this is exactly what this shows here, okay? The interactive governor, the one that we took, has about 15 to 20 variables that allows one to tune, okay, that can be tuned. Um, we mainly dealt with the high-speed load and high-speed freak, okay, which is basically at, if the system is loaded at X, go to this frequency. Um, as I said earlier, we made sure that below 85% of CPU load we would be running on the, A15 on the A7 cluster. And above that, so between 85 and 95, we would use the first six operating point on the A15. Below 95%, you reach the overdrive point. 
right? Maximum power. Um, in the interactive governor, we found out that there were a few gotchas. Uh, perfect example is the above high speed delay and the timer rate. So above high speed delay we saw here is how much time it takes to go from one operating point to another. Right? But if your timer rate, which is the amount every time, but how often you check for a readjustment of the, the operating point, if that is twice as long as your above high speed delay, then you're missing half of, cha of the chances to adjust the system. Right? As I said, you can really shoot yourself in the foot uh, with big little if you don't tune your system properly. Okay. Um, yeah. So earlier I presented like the, the blue box. Uh, there was the, the the blue the blue diamond. There was the red box, and there was the the green triangle. So these are the configuration that we. These are the numbers for the configuration that will yield these uh, these con these uh, these performance point. Okay. So upstreaming. We have started upstreaming this solution. All of the code that pertains to the power management of the cluster has been pushed by Nicola. Uh, and so far, I understand that they have received uh, favorable reviews on the, the mailing list. Following that, so this is really the foundation of the solution, the power management. So as soon as that is, is, uh, has been accepted, we will move on to uh, the next stages. Our goal is to upstream it entirely. Um, regardless, the entire, the entire code base will become public. The entire solution will become public as soon as one of our member uh, releases a product with the solution in it. Okay. And these are all the people that have contributed to this project. And there's a lot of more people at ARM um, that don't appear 